Good afternoon. Welcome to the Center for Disaster Philanthropy webinar, Numbers Don't Lie, Data, Disasters, and Racial Disparities. This is Tanya Gulliver-Garcia. I'm the Director of Learning and Partnerships at CDP, and my pronouns are she, her, hers. This webinar is funded by a generous grant from the Rita Allen Foundation and is co-sponsored by the Council on Foundations, ABFI, a philanthropic partnership for black communities, Change Philanthropy, the Funders Network, and Charity Navigator. Just a few reminders before we get started. If you're on Twitter, please use the hashtag CDP for recovery to share and join the discussion. You can submit questions at any time using the Q&A box and they will be answered at the end of the panel presentation. And this webinar is being recorded and it will be available on our website and YouTube channel shortly after the webinar is complete. As we begin our discussion today, I want to acknowledge that I've spent most of my life in Treaty 13 territory, more commonly known in English as Toronto, Ontario. That land is a traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Ishnabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat people, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. I now live in Balbancha, the, land, the place of many tongues, also known as New Orleans, Louisiana. Balbancha served as a major pre-colonial trade hub for the region, and is home to more than 40 indigenous nations including the Chitimacha, the Choctaw, the Ataka Ishak, the Caddo, Homa, Tunica, and Natchez nations. Our speakers will be joining us from other traditional territories across Turtle Island. So as we discuss the impact of race during disasters, let us recognize that indigenous peoples are the original stewards of the land. The ways in which indigenous peoples have been displaced and disenfranchised from the land, not just by natural or environmental disasters, but by the social, economic, and cultural disaster of colonialism. To bring any particular land back to health and balance, we must acknowledge and return it to its original stewards who are still here today. And so we must also consider the ways by which philanthropy and data have become colonized and need to become decolonized. Before we move to the panel itself, I wanted to share some data on disasters and philanthropy, as well as a few terms you may hear throughout the webinar. According to NOAA, the first nine months of 2020 ties the annual record of 16 events that occurred in 2011 and 2017. 2020 is the sixth consecutive year, 2015 to 2020, in which more than 10 or more billion dollar weather and climate disasters have impacted the U.S. And over the last 41 years, there have been um, several years with these 10 or more separate billion dollar disasters, most of them in the last couple of decades. In just a few weeks, CDP and our partners at Candid will be releasing our newest Measuring the State of Disaster Philanthropy, looking at the disasters that took place in 2018. From last year's report, though, which looked at disasters in 2017, including Hurricanes Harvey, Irma, Maria, the Mexican earthquake, and California wildfires, we know that $504 million was contributed globally, mostly to natural disasters by foundations. And while this was a significant amount compared to previous years, we've analyzed, NOAA reported that 2017's disasters in the U.S. alone totaled $321.8 billion. And as our speakers will discuss today, discuss disaster recovery and re rebuilding communities, especially those most impacted, is a long and expensive process. Yet in 2017, 64% of the money over 320 million went to response and relief, and a mere 17% or 83 million went to reconstruction and recovery. And then as always, it seems these days we can't have a conversation without talking about COVID. Uh, CDP and Candid released a report a few weeks ago that examined philanthropic giving to COVID. When we compare COVID giving to other disasters, we see that it far surpasses all other giving combined. However, it's a global pandemic and has affected every aspect of our lives and economy. 
But you can see that up to June 30th, COVID giving was 11.9 billion. And when you compare that to hurricanes Dorian, Harvey, Irma, Maria, the Australian bushfires, which by the way was just this year, um, they don't e even equal half of 1 billion. COVID-19 philanthropy also dwarfs funding for the last major epidemic, the 2014 Ebola outbreak in West Africa, when about $363 million was announced over a period of six months. And I just want to share some common definitions. I think many of us may use these terms or know these terms, but just to make sure that we're all on the same page. Black Indigenous People of Color or BIPOC is used to expand the commonly used term POC or People of Color. And it acknowledges that not all people of color face equal levels of injustice. So it's specifically calling out Black and Indigenous people who are severely impacted by systemic racial injustices. Colonization generally can be seen as some form of invasion, dispossession, subjugation of a people, um, and dispossession of land. Settler coloni colonialism specifically refers to colonization in which colonizing powers create permanent or long-term settlement on land that is owned, occupied, stewarded by other people. Racial equity is a condition that would be achieved if one's racial identity no longer predicted in a statistical sense how one fares. So when we're thinking about this term or when we're using this term, we're thinking about racial equity as one part of racial justice and work to address root causes of inequities, not just their manifestation. So this is policies, practices, attitudes, cultural messages that reinforce differential outcomes by race or fail to eliminate them. And then finally, racial justice is the proactive and reinforcement of policies, practices, attitudes, and, and actions that produce equitable power, access, opportunities, treatment, impacts, and outcomes for all. It is a systemic, fair, and, um, sorry, it is a systemic, fair treatment of people of all races, resulting in equitable opportunities and outcomes for all, and goes beyond just anti-racism because it's very deliberate. And I really want to thank um, the folks behind Racial Equity Tools who put this together along with many other definitions and encourage you to check out their toolkits and their glossary. So now the more exciting part of the uh, process and our webinar, I want to move to introducing our panel. Um, so our speakers today are Dr. Lori Peake, who's a professor in the Department of Sociology and director of the Natural Hazard Center at the University of Colorado Boulder, where she studies and writes about vulnerable populations and disasters. Lori has conducted field investigations in the aftermath of the 9-11 terrorist attack, Hurricane Katrina, the BP oil spill, the Christchurch earthquake, the Joplin tornado, Superstorm Sandy, and Hurricane Matthew. Antoine Richards serves as a senior advisor for the Institute for Diversity and Inclusion in Emergency Management and is a Doctor of Science student at Jacksonville State University, where his research interest includes the intersection of public health and emergency management, social vulnerability and social determinants of health, community resilience, community capacity building, and sustainability. And for the first time that we can think of, we have two speakers with the same name, or same first name. Lori Villarosa is the founder and executive director of the Philanthropic Initiative for Racial Equity, or PRE, where she works with a diverse board of racial justice leaders and movement partners to significantly shift grant-making practices through a number of activities, including pre-publications, such as the seminal Grant-Making with a Racial Equity Lens Guide, and a more recent grant making with a racial justice lens, the practical guide. Lori's been a pioneer working consistently at the intersection of racial justice and philanthropy for nearly 30 years, engaging with thousands of funders at the community level, regional, nationally, and internationally to increase resources to combat systemic, systemic racism. So welcome to the three of you and thank you for taking time out of your busy schedules to join us. So Lori V, Let's start with you. Um, I highlighted some definitions and began the discussion on racial equity, but what is Pre's definition of applying a racial equity and racial justice lens to our work? 
Great. Well, thank you so much. And I really appreciate um, Center for Disaster Philanthropy for including me. And yes, I should have noted that there were two Lori's. I would have gone by Lorelei, but Lori V will, will work. Uh, I really, I, there's so many different definitions and I, I don't disagree with the way racial equity and racial justice were defined on your initial slides. And, and we work closely with the racial equity tools folks and those, those are very legitimate definitions. But one of the things that we've done is really look to the field of practitioners and advocates and, and, and then also those who are trying to do racial equity work or support racial equity and racial justice work in philanthropy and lifted up some of the key components, some of the key features of a racial equity lens and a racial justice lens. And this is from our updated guide. The, the items in blue are from our first guide that actually came out in 2006. And one of the things I often noted is that it comes, they came out before the iPhone. And so when we think about how much our lives have changed and how ubiquitous uh, smartphones are and how, how much it's influenced us, it's interesting to think about the, the realities of how we were defining and trying to move funders to do more to use a racial equity lens at that point are still very true today. And so in fact, we still say all of these components for a racial equity lens are critical. And that means analyzing data and information about race and ethnicity critically understanding the disparities and the reasons why they exist. And one of the things that we often found, particularly in the, uh, throughout the earlier 2000s and mid 2000s was that funders might look at some aspects of disparities, but then they would drop off in terms of having honest conversations about why people believed they existed. And then a racial equity lens requires that you look at the structural root causes of the problems and then name race explicitly when talking about both the problems and the solutions. And that's another area where we often saw drop off that you might have funders who would talk about the problems, but then when it came time to solutions, they would revert back to universal language and they would really lose anything that acknowledged that the solutions also had to recognize all of these different dynamics of racial impacts. In the last year, we then went to look at what needed to be built on and recognizing that we've had much more movement uh, in the field of, of, of movement leaders and practitioners emphasizing racial justice and some parts of philanthropy moving in that direction. And so while all of the, the points uh, in blue are in the blue columns are still critical, for a racial justice lens, we really wanted to lift up the need to understand and acknowledge racial history create a shared affirmative vision of a fair and inclusive society. And those two pieces are things that I think we're seeing over and over again right now are in such dispute in our country and really around the world. And in fact, that is part of why we would say so much of the battle and the terrain goes around trying to have um, the, some of the erasure of racial history currently with the executive order trying to ban uh, anti-racist training and trying to really undo the ability for different uh, federally supported organizations to actually look at and understand what went into their racial history. Ironically, while they're trying to defend the c continuation of lifting up uh, Confederate uh, statues, so they're very selective about when the history matters. But our side would say it's really important to both understand and acknowledge the detrimental racial history and then have space to be able to create affirmative vision of what it would mean. And then this third point is perhaps the most critical, that it focuses explicitly on building civic, cultural, economic, and political power by those most impacted. And I think that the rest of our discussion today will really get at what that means and why it's so critical to the funding. And then lastly, that emphasizes transformative solutions that impact multiple systems. We recognize how interwoven uh, the different systems are, and, and perhaps there will be spaces that we'll be talking about this in more uh, detail. I don't want to take up too much time right here, but there are interventions that we can do 
that reflect the realities of um, how many of these systems are uh, affecting our communities and that there are actually solutions that can tackle them all at once. Next slide. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Um, well, just to recap, the one thing that's really important is to recognize that racial justice lens really calls for the confrontation of power and the redistribution of resources. And I know these are difficult things when we get to the later part of the discussion. I'm going to talk about how we can tackle some of what can be touchy conversations in our institutions, in recognizing that even those phrases, confrontation of power, redistribution of resources, will set off some, some boards, but we'll really get into why it's so critical to be um, explicit about that and understand that. Thank you. Thanks, Lori. And, and you're right, we're going to come back to that after. Um, uh, Lori P and Antoine uh, talk about some of the data because I think it's important for us to figure out now that we know the data, where do we move forward? So Lori P, let's switch to you. Uh, you have published two studies that have used national data to identify gendered and racialized patterns in terms of disaster related deaths among children and the elderly. So could you tell us a little bit more about those studies and what the data have revealed? Absolutely. And Tanya, first, I just want to thank you for bringing us together and the Center for Disaster Philanthropy for convening this important conversation. And so um, thank you for having me. And it's an honor to be here with Lori V and with Antoine. Um, so as you mentioned, you're right, over the, the past decade, actually, I've had the, the good fortune to work with a number of collaborators on two different papers that look at one particular outcome. So in both the 2008 paper that I worked on with Sammy Zaran and Sam Brody, where we were looking at youth mortality by forces of nature, and then just recently, just this last month, I worked with the team, the amazing team here at the Natural Hazard Center and our colleague at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention to publish a recent study on mortality among older adults. And what binds both of these papers together, even though we're looking at different age groups in the papers, is we're trying to understand how does mortality vary by age, gender, race, and disaster type in the United States? And of course, disaster-related mortality is just one outcome that disasters may generate, but we are very interested in disaster-related mortality because we think it's one indicator of how well a society is doing in terms of protecting its potentially most vulnerable populations. So in order to answer that big question looming over both of those papers, we used data from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, and specifically we use their uh, CDC Wonder database, which actually contains mortality and population counts for all US counties. And the way that disaster mortality is determined is by the National Center for Health Statistics using death certificates for all US residents that attribute death to forces of nature. So Ruja, next slide, please. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna give a very brief snapshot of our key findings from those two papers so that our wonderful participants out there can get a, a sense of what we found. So for the child and youth paper where we were looking at people ages zero to 24, we found the following that overall children's overall risk of death in disaster in the US is actually relatively low, but of that zero to 24 age group infants or those age zero to one are most at risk for death and disaster. In terms of gender, we found that male children are at higher risk of death from disaster than female children across the zero to 24 age cohorts. When you start uh, doing more of an intersectional analysis and looking at race plus age plus gender, we found that African American male children ages zero to four are most at risk, while white male children in that five to 24 age group are most at risk to death by disaster. 
and in terms of disaster type and how that drives these disaster related uh, mortality disparities. We found that the zero to four age group are most likely to die in extreme heat. The five to 14 year old age group most likely to die in cataclysmic storms and floods. And the 15 to 24 age group or the adolescent and young adults are most likely to die of excessive cold. Uh, next slide, please. So in our second, more recently published paper, we actually were able to look at data from 1999 to 2017 that was available through CDC Wonder. And here were some of our key findings, both across all age cohorts, but also specific to older adults. So we found that between 1999 and 2017, there were over 22,000 disaster-related deaths in the United States that were recorded in the CDC Wonder database, and over 9,000 of those were concentrated in the 60-plus age category. Um, across all age cohorts, older adults are most at risk. And in fact, we found that uh, the crude mortality rate for the 60 plus populations is more than double the mortality rate, rate for the larger population. Again, in terms of gender, males uh, have consistently higher mortality rates than females across all age and racial uh, categories. In terms of race, we found clear disparities with American Indian and Alaska Native populations having the highest mortality rate, followed by Blacks, then Whites, then Latinos, followed by Asians and Pacific Islanders. And then last but not least, when you do, again, that intersectional analysis and look across rage, race plus age plus gender plus disaster type, we found that older adult male um, American Indian and Alaska Native populations were most likely to die in excessive cold and they had the highest mortality rate, followed by older adult male Black populations who were most likely to die in cataclysmic storms. So Tanya, thank you for giving me time to go through a bit of that. I think the big takeaway is that there are clear patterns to who is most likely to live and who is most likely to die in these disasters. And so this is a major justice issue that is worth unpacking. And again, thanks for letting me be a part of this conversation. Back to you, thank you. Thanks, Lori, and feeling really glad to be a, a female right now. Um, Antoine, I have a couple questions for you. Uh, to start, obviously COVID is one of the most recent examples of a disaster that is rife with disaster disparities. And I know you've been looking at this, so can you tell us about some of the data that's come out during the pandemic and how BIPOC communities are differentially impacted? Absolutely, and first and foremost, I wanted to say thank you for having me on this uh, very necessary discussion on data disasters and uh, racial disparities. Also, I'm um, very humbled to be serving with both Lori's. Uh, to your point, this is my first time, I think, being on, a panel, being on a panel with two people of the same name, so we're trailblazing here. Um, I wanted to preface a bit of this question by just giving a quick overview of social determinants of health. You can see the slide there, but social determinants of health are the conditions in our environment that contribute to our outcomes. The conditions are both as chronic and as acute as the diseases that um, increase death and diseases among people of color. Next slide, please. So when we look at social determinants of health, that includes everything from access and availability of resources to education, healthcare, transportation, culture, access to information and technology, and housing and community design, among many of the other items that you see listed here. And when we think about emergency management and disasters, we closely identify a lot with public safety, such as fire, EMS, police, et cetera, but failure to associate all of the factors that we see on the screen here fuels the inequity, which really brightens during crises. And we see that in COVID-19. Next slide, please. So I was a big fan of um, Lori's previous uh, presentation on some of the data, and you'll start to see why, because there are a lot of similarities in what she said. But to, to your question, X, COVID-19 is only an eye-opener to those that have been blind to the obvious. Racial disparities, health outcomes, health disparities, health equity and inequities have been ongoing issues throughout the history of the United States. American Indians and Alaskan Natives 
to Lori's point, are 5.3 times more likely to be hospitalized than any other race during COVID-19, while Blacks are 2.1 times more likely to die from the disease. Blacks and Hispanics are more likely to work in service-related industries that deem them essential workers, while being nearly three times more likely to contract, this, to, to contract the disease. And this is further exacerbated by those who cannot afford private transportation and are subject to the overcrowding on public transportation, which increases their risk of contracting the disease as a lot of the routes were decreased during the pandemic. There's overcrowding in housing as BIPOC communities often live generationally. So mom, dad, grandmother, grandfather, and then of course the children, all within one household. And studies have even shown now that they are less likely to have enough savings to sustain for three months. So for those that are risking unemployment and there's one primary breadwinner, that immediately goes out the window given the current economic crisis due to COVID-19. Even as far as testing is concerned, Blacks are 1.7 times more likely to live in highly vulnerable communities and three times more likely to live in a testing desert. This only scratches the surface, but I really encourage you to think about the policies, the programs, and the practices that have historically contributed to the outcomes because they are the root causes of vulnerability. And uh, the biggest thing to take away from this is that we have to begin to identify the root causes of vulnerability if we want to move forward. The trends that are coming out during COVID-19 are not new trends. A lot of the information that you see here matches even some of the information that uh, Lori just presented in her previous slides. When you look at the deaths for American Indians and Alaska Natives being higher than other races. So COVID is not giving us anything new. It's giving us what's always been there and we need to open our eyes to it. Thanks. Thanks Antoine. And let's, let's build on that a little more. Um, at CDP, we've always been saying that every funder is a disaster funder because we know that the issues that make people vulnerable post-disaster um, are really root cause issues that uh, lead to an individual's social vulnerability. So how does COVID data compare to other disasters? What have you found? So when you look at a lot of the research on like resilience and vulnerability, um, we've always seen inequity in disaster outcomes. Hurricane Katrina was really a landmark disaster for that. And we still see communities of color that have yet to fully recover from Hurricane Katrina, even though things have kind of gotten back to normal operations. Um, these maps up here really tell a story. So the first map tells the story of how the majority of black individuals live within the southern region of the United States. And directly below that, we're looking at mortality as it pertains to diabetes and cancer. And you can see the trends there where a lot of the more red states are along the southern states, including some of the areas up north where we have cities such as New York or Chicago or Detroit. And moving into Chicago, the map on the top right shows us the uh, racial distribution or particularly among blacks in Chicago. And below that, we look at the impact of deaths related to the 1995 Chicago heat wave. And we can see how those really closely aligned to where the majority population of Blacks um, resided in Chicago. So the story behind all of this is that there are trends and connections in death, disease, disaster, and mortality as it relates to um, racial disparities. Even now, when we look at the current COVID-19 disaster and the Chicago heat wave, we, we, we recognize that during the heat wave, after we saw increased mortality among Black populations, the way they handled the bodies was to put them in freezer trucks and um, hold them until they found something to do. And that's something that we've seen during COVID in the early days. The thing that's heart, really hurtful here for me is that our handling of disasters has not changed much. 1995 and 2020 is a 25 year gap that we're seeing the same approaches to disaster and mortality and we're seeing the same racial disparities. We're seeing it in Lake Charles right now where they were without power for a long time and there have been studies that have shown that more affluent communities get their power restored or get the resources before communities of color. So when we talk about funding, there is a huge lack of equity in transaction. And what I mean by that is that resources are not equitably distributed to vulnerable groups. We have to start to work towards thinking more equitably in how we do our resources, whether it's funding the communities 
or funding initiatives and program within the community that decrease vulnerability that are based on vulnerability and not based on just saying I did something because it was something to do. Many organizations that dedicate their time to combating inequity are really not adequately funded. So that's another thing to really look into. Personally with IDEM, um, a lot of our work we've done without a single funder. There are a lot of brilliant thought leaders and community organizations without clear funders in 2020, and that is also a problem. COVID-19 is not much different from other disasters in terms of inequity and disparity. And if we want to improve upon that, we have to really focus on getting rid of those vulnerabilities, the root causes of vulnerability, because as you've noted, the impact and the cost of disasters are only rising, and that's due to the inequitable access that uh, communities of color are facing. So the biggest takeaway from here is that when we look at the data now, and we look at it 25 years ago, and we look at it further back, there's not much difference between COVID-19 and disasters in terms of inequity and how communities of color are treated or the outcomes that are associated with it. Thank you. Thanks, Antoine. And, and you're right. I think a lot of it is maybe this is just making it a little more visible for folks or, or reminding people about what we could have and should have learned in Katrina and in the Chicago heat wave. Uh, Lori Peek, I, I want to follow up on these questions with you because you have been researching these areas uh, for some time and, and the Natural Hazard Center has really been looking at this. The title of the webinar is Numbers Don't Lie. And you shared with us some you know, fairly shocking numbers about disproportionate deaths among boys and men and, and among people of color in this nation. But I suspect that that doesn't even begin to capture everything. So let's talk about data generally. What are the pros and cons of, of big data and, and doing more research like Antoine was talking about? Mm. Yeah. I, so Tanya, I just thank you for asking that. And I want to acknowledge um, that disasters obviously can just feel so random and so horrible. And right now I'm looking out at beautiful Boulder, Colorado that is blanketed in smoke. On Saturday, my husband and I and all of our neighbors were displaced from our home as part of the Calwood fire evacuation um, that has displaced thousands of Boulder County residents over the past 72 hours. And so I know um, with my whole being uh, that disasters can feel random and horrible. But as Antoine just said so beautifully, there are patterns to these events. And I think to your question, Tanya, where, what is the biggest pro of, or one of the big pros of big data and the increasing use of big data in the hazards and disaster field is that big data is helping us to find new patterns to verify long-standing patterns uh, in terms of disaster-related disparities. It's helping us to find those disparities within specific events, but also to trace them across events. Um, big data is also increasingly helping the science and technology community to work directly with the emergency management community so we can target resources and get them to the people in the places that need them most. And so big data is helping us to really illuminate a longstanding finding of social science disaster research, which is that disasters are not equal opportunity events. Next slide, please. Now, to the second part of your question, though, Tanya, about what is the possible con of big data, even though it's playing such an important role in so many ways in the hazards and disaster field. So um, one big con is obviously that we only see what and who we measure, and we certainly do not measure everything. And so I was using CDC wonder data, looking at disaster related mortality statistics, but we know that not every disaster related uh, death gets recorded in our databases. We know that there is a lot of contestation around what is a direct disaster death versus an indirect disaster death. So data are complicated and we need to question um, what is being measured as much as we question what is not being measured. 
And to make that concrete, I want to tell you a quick story from after Tanya mentioned that I, I did work after 9-11 on the backlash against Muslim Americans. And um, one, the first person who was actually murdered in a 9-11 related backlash crime was Valbir Singh Sodhi. He was a gas station owner who was an immigrant to the United States, had, was living the American dream, owned his business, and he was shot and, and murdered by a man named Frank Rock. Our FBI hate crime statistics do not have a category for um, anti-Sikh related hate crimes. So Balbir Singh Sodhi was not Muslim, nor was he Arab, who Frank Rock thought he was targeting a Muslim or an Arab person. Instead, he ended up killing a Sikh. And so this is a, a really um, dramatic, specific, and heartbreaking example of sometimes when we do not have categories in our big data, then we may be missing important trends and phenomena that are unfolding in our social world. Next slide, please. There is also a risk that as we move toward more and more big data, even again, given the important role that it's playing, that sometimes data become just a gray statistical blur. Think about how many disaster related statistics we have heard in this short webinar already. And it has this way of when we're presenting those to communities and to people that those numbers may just literally blur between behind right in front of our eyes. And so for that reason, I think it's important that we always couple statistics with stories because behind every number, there is a story. And we know that sometimes our statistics can't tell us about the underlying mechanisms that are driving the disparities that we see. And so for that reason, I think it's so important that we continue to invest in quantitative and qualitative data collection so that we can couple those and so that we can move forward together to address the challenges that this research continues to show. Thank you, Tanya. Thanks, Lori. Um, you said earlier something that struck me. You said, we only see what we measure and we do not measure everything. So what do you think is missing in terms of race and disaster data that perhaps philanthropy could look at funding in, in their own community? Mm, yeah, thank you for asking that question and thank you for bringing um, this community together to have this conversation. So I'm just gonna, in the interest of time, I have two thoughts on that. So um, next slide, please. So one of the first things that I wanted to say in response to your question is that um, it's important that we continue to invest in projects where we are measuring disparities, where we are tracking disparities. As Lori V said at the beginning, there are actually some assaults on scientific integrity that are happening right now that if we stop measuring these disparities, we cannot address a problem that we are not talking about, that we're not measuring and so forth. So it is absolutely critical that we continue to measure uh, disparities. At the same time, it's equally critical that we focus on the strengths and the capacities of socially marginalized groups, including racial and ethnic minorities, low-income communities, the elderly, and other groups that are oftentimes at the margins of our society. So Antoine referred to the 1995 Chicago heat wave earlier, and he showed a pressing map that, that illustrated the disaster-related mortality disparities among Black elderly men and also white elderly men. And um, Eric Kleinenberg wrote a really important book called Heat Wave, and one of his key findings was that there were these clear gender and age and race-related uh, disparities in terms of disaster deaths, but then he found that low-income Latinos actually had much lower mortality rates than would have been expected in that heat wave. And so I think that's a great example of where by disentangling the numbers and going in and looking deeper, he actually discover, discovered these incredible strengths and capacities in the Latino community that has now become a model for many community-based uh, heat wave mitigation programs where we're bringing communities together. So I think that's an example of a place where we could fund. Um, and then next slide, please. 
One other um, place that I think that we clearly need to invest is in the workforce to make sure that we have a 21st century workforce that is prepared to meet the 21st century demands that are being placed on our research community, our practice community, and our policy community. The various communities that are working together that are trying to study and trying to serve the most disadvantaged populations. Right now, we do not have a workforce that is ready for this ever more turbulent world that we are facing. And so I think this is an enormous opportunity to invest in various education programs, in workforce development programs, to make sure that we are moving forward. And right now in our hazards and disaster field, we have the Bill Anderson Fund, we have the Minority Surge Capacity in Disasters Fund, which Antoine is one of the fellows. And these programs are about ensuring that we have a diverse next generation workforce that is ready to help mitigate the most severe consequences of hazards and disasters. So I think we need more programs like that so that we can work together to mitigate the severe consequences of natural hazards and other disasters that we face, but also so we can address those severe underlying power differentials and racial uh, disparities that Lori V kicked us off by talking about today. So thank you again, Tanya. Thanks, Lori. And, and I'm going to switch Lori's again. So Lori V, I think Often in philanthropy, we position our grant making to look at how to do risk assessment or review BIPOC-led organizations thinking that they're more risky. Um, PRE has developed a list of criteria to be used before funding predominantly white organizations. So can you share that with us and talk about it a little bit? Yes, and just to clarify and, and uh this is from our guide to grant making with the racial justice lens that the bulk of the guide is talking about the importance of course of funding black and brown indigenous led organizations we we are explaining why it's both more effective why it is uh, more important for reaching longer term sustainable transformation that is really connected to communities and recognizing the strengths of communities. So the framing of this, I, I, to be honest, I hadn't thought about the fact that this was going to be separated from my earlier slides in a way that it might seem strange, like why am I talking about funding white organizations as if that's the goal. And the reality is, what right, we of course. Need, unfortunately, over and over again, uh, especially in areas like disaster funding, but in, in all areas, is that not only is the funding in so many fields disproportionately going to majority white-led organizations, but even when the goal is to reach more communities of color, the funding goes to white-led organizations to do that. And, and, and I would say, while we don't necessarily have all the data for this because of the ways that uh, the limitations on what gets reported as being um, uh, white-led or black-led or Latino-led um, grant making in terms of the the what we have to rely on with candid and uh, foundation center guide star data but we see over and over again this this pattern where there is an assumption in a disaster in an emergency situation that you need to move money quickly, you need to move it in a way that there is a presumption of who has what kind of a capacity to do what kind of work. But the reality is you so often will have organizations of color that are subsidizing the growth and the building of predominantly white organizations to then in turn reach their communities. And what you often have, and we just saw this just um, in the beginning of the COVID pandemic, where large grants were going to predominantly white intermediaries who then bring on consultants. They, they, they're not even building up their own internal capacity half the time to be able to reach different communities of color. And then they bring on some kind of advisory group. Perhaps they actually even pay that advisory group for its time and expertise, but that payment is never equal to what they're actually investing. And even if it was, it's that payment for a moment that's taking them away 
from the urgent work that they need to be doing in their own communities. And so we go through a lot of those problems before we come to this slide here to say, if you are going to continue to do this, make sure you've gone through all of these questions first. And if you um, go through these questions, if you first think about, is there an organization of color already working in the same space? And particularly if you're thinking, yes, but they don't have X, Y, or Z, you're often going to be subsidizing one way or the other. And so which is it? Is it going to be that you're maybe subsidizing a particular level of technical reach or some other aspect of scale. Maybe what you might want to do is give the funding to the black or brown led organization. And if there is in fact a value of the white organization, let them subcontract to, to the white organization for whatever particular piece they might have. Um, if in fact that's even something that they need. Uh, thinking about do, does the one who is getting the funding, if, if you are going in this direction of an intermediary, do they really understand the scale of change that is needed? Do they really know the complexities? Because what we often find is they don't, and then you've now got some, uh, the number of advisory groups who are not only going away from their own community work, but they're having to do the emotional labor of deciding, you know, do I intervene now? Do I fight this battle or do I let this one go? Because what you often have is the framing of the problems and the solutions get started by the predominantly white organization that may not really be in touch, might not have a clear understanding. And so you're in really being inefficient with your resources. And ironically, at a moment where we know we have the, the least ability to waste resources. And so I'm not gonna go through each one of these points. I would encourage folks to check it out in our guide, but we're really trying to shift the recognition of if you really wanna talk about merit, if you really wanna talk about scale and impact and effectiveness, you will shift the mindset that we so often have. Um, uh, next slide. So there was one thing that we say after we go through, I, I didn't list all of the different questions there, but if you've gone through all of those points, and in some cases, there might still be a reason. There might be an institution that is large enough, has enough reach, has enough reason to be in it. It might, in fact, be that the communities of color want them to be doing more. So there may be all of these reasons to, to still put your funding in that direction. There are ways that both those organizations and the funders can do this in a way that is ideally building greater racial justice um, impacts and effectiveness, both for the predominantly white organizations and for the broader community. And so we lift up some different practices that funders can think about, about, um, you know, if you're, if you're, you are the predominantly white organization, are there ways that you can introduce your, your um, uh, black and brown partners to directly to the funders? So in the next round, they are the ones who are known. Are there ways that if there is um, training needed that funders can, instead of funding the white organization to then access training, fund the ones doing the training to be strategic about who they're going to partner with. Um, and so these are a number of the pieces that we would lift up here. Next slide. Thanks, or Lori. Yeah, let's just build on that a little more because I, you know, I think funders are sometimes struggling with how they do this and, and you've started talking about that but what are some other strategies to really encourage philanthropy to be more intentional in their racial justice work it's one of the the questions somebody just asked is how do we get them to do it yeah well you know it's so interesting and one of the things and, and i appreciate it in lori uh peaks piece about so many of the data questions and i know that she's predominantly talking about the data in terms of impacts but we're also seeing so much going on right now in terms of the data about who is funding what we see these headlines about how many more funders are supporting racial equity and racial justice and i will say i i was um uh thinking that the the name of this webinar is a little interesting in terms of the data don't lie because sometimes the data don't lie but they do a little these two skew things in different ways and so we have some sense that there are a lot of funders saying they're funding work around racial equity that might not be doing it yet and so we try to uh, lift up how they can be more clear how they can be more precise but we 
do have a moment right now where there is more willingness, there is more interest in being more effective, and yet there's still a lot of resistance and there's still a lot of challenges. And so we try to go through and lift up a number of the ones that we hear often and flip it to say, how can you address these? And so we've talked a little bit about, is this really our mission? I think that the data that Lori and Antoine talked about should be convincing to disaster funders about why it would be important that they do this. But if the data don't prove the point to your foundation, there are enough other or funders in the field these days who are being much more creative, much more intentional, that you can show examples of peers who are bringing, doing this work. Maybe you can bring some of them in. Um, this question about won't it turn some people off? So even some of the phrasing and some of the way that we talk about these issues, I've had funders say, well, you know, but if we talk about this, you know, won't that upset um, some part of our constituency? And it's interesting the way that gets asked so often is it presumes centering of white constituencies. It presumes that who you're most worried about turning off is our white folks. If you're talking about, oh, well, won't they be upset if we're talking about um, where the different strengths are. And so partly it's really recognizing if in fact we know that these communities are more impacted, if we believe that the answers are there because they are going to be more in touch and, and they are going to be more committed for the long haul, then who is it that you're worrying about uh, you know, turning off or not? Um, the other ones are a little bit more technical in terms of thinking about it's so often a, a piece in, in philanthropy where people will feel like, yes, 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 this is all important, but you know, there's so much urgency, we don't have time. And so what we're trying to say is you're always making a choice. You are either making a choice to continue the status quo, most likely perpetuate the disparities, or you're making a choice to shift it. And so the same operations, the same budgeting process, the same uh, you know, RFP process can be done in a way that's anti-racist or it's in a way that can be continuing it. Um, and then the last ones, I will say, these are a little bit more specific to when we're talking about foundations making overall shifts, but there are some realities that there are some strengths that some folks within your foundation are going to have, that they, there's some that might not be comfortable with this, they might not be looking to go this direction, and that's where we start getting into the tough call of really recognizing what is your mission and, and are, is this approach mission to line? We would argue it is. And so you might have to have some revisiting of some of uh, you know, who in fact, again, has the capacity. So in the same way that we're talking about who has the capacity on the grantee side, it might be a question of who within your own institution has the capacity. Thank you. And uh, we're just a, a couple minutes away from a couple Q and A's, but Antoine, I wanna ask you one last question. Uh, your work focuses at the emergency manager level a lot, but I know that funders could learn from the idea of doing social vulnerability or equity assessments as part of their grant making. So can you talk about some of the key aspects of that and how funders could adapt it to make sure they're reaching people and organizations that need support? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm going to start that off by saying that um, I really enjoyed um, both Lori's presentations previously on those slides, it speaks a lot to the equity and transaction that I spoke of earlier. And that brings me to this point that there are opportunities for research and action, and then there is opportunistic research and action. And um, to Lori V's choice, you do have a choice. Are we going to be opportunistic about who we fund? Or are we funding this just to say that we did it? Or are we being intentional about what it is that we're doing and who we're funding? There are a lot of organizations out there that are doing the work that have the community engagement that are already involved in those communities that are often overlooked and not funded, you know, be it for whatever reason. It could be, you know, it's not written into the grant process or that, you know, again, their annual operating budget may not warrant them to receive the amount of funding that they should receive. Those are issues that we want to look at. So, um, I encourage everybody to take ownership of, of the actions and decisions that are being made. And um, in doing so, I want you to think about a little bit, I guess a little bit about my background. I grew up on the west side of Atlanta. I grew up in a food desert. Some people call it the hood. Um, more young black males, more black people went to jail in my one zip code alone than any other zip code in the city of Atlanta and metropolitan Atlanta. 
And one of the things that they decided to do when they saw that obesity was rising because we had to eat a lot of fast food and all that was decide to spend millions of dollars on putting sidewalks in the neighborhood. And then nobody used the sidewalks. Nobody went for walks. And they said, well, we spent all of this money on this and they're not even using it. They finally had a community town hall and found out that, hey, we don't walk because it's just not safe. It's no street lights. People are going to jail out here. We don't really trust the police. Those are things that could really be identified if we do vulnerability assessments and then also equity assessments to begin to look at what it is. Um, I really like this slide and this information came from Dr. Atia Martin and it focuses on social vulnerability. And I'm a public health practitioner by trade. So we always talk about social vulnerability. So when I started to get into emergency, I mean, social determinants of health. So when I got into emergency management, I saw social vulnerability come up and I said, well, this is interesting. They're pretty much the same thing. But in order for me to operate in the space of emergency management, I needed to meet emergency management where it was at. So I began to look at intersections between social determinants of health and social vulnerability. And I say that because if we want to be impactful with our funding and our approaches, we have to start to meet the communities where they are. We have to do these vulnerability assessments, identify the root causes of vulnerability, so then we can eliminate those because those are what contribute to disparity. If we're gonna talk about equity assessments, we then need to discover where we are not practicing equity at. So a vulnerability assessment very easily will help you identify factors that contribute to it. Now the equity assessment helps you explore the why. Why is this an issue? Is it redlining? Are we gentrifying this? Are there areas here where we could have better mitigated? And it requires you to start to look into your policies, programs, and practices. It, it, it speaks to evaluation, which is something else that we miss. So social vulnerability and equity assessments allow you to identify those factors, but then also to evaluate where we are and see where we need to start. Because through that, we can create evidence-based strategies. We often get caught up in the talk of best practices, best practices, but no disaster is alike. So there is no best practice for a disaster. There's different communities or different people, but there are strategies or approaches that we can take, such as ensuring equity and transaction that will help us create better outcomes for disasters. So um, next slide, please. So when we look at this, we really wanna to start to understand that vulnerability is more than just, um, you know, identifying who's vulnerable. It also influences risk. And we do a lot of risk assessments. By having vulnerability assessments and equity assessments, we begin to make risk-informed decisions, which are more proactive and not risk-based decisions. We begin to look at and understand equity over equality better. And there are a few tools out there, Social Vulnerability Index by the CDC, um, SOVI, Dr. Susan Cutter came out with SOVI, which is the Social Vulnerability Index. Community Assessment for Public Health and Emergency Response, or CASPER, is another assessment that is out there. Um, and I really encourage you to start to look at community-based participatory research because your community members, who you serve, who you protect, their life and their property in your roles, have all of the answers that you need if you really discuss them and actually include them in decision making and focus on evaluating those things moving forward. Thanks. Thank you, Antoine. Um, we have just two minutes left and um, I wanna, uh, I think move to, the, to our, our takeaways and um, I'm gonna commit to um, sending out the, the questions and getting some answers over the next few days and we'll post those on our website because um, I want to make sure that the answers people have posed get um, get answered if they weren't already. Uh, so in terms of our takeaways and, and what we heard from the panel, um, funders need to be intentional in their grant making. Flexibility is critical as disaster recovery does not have a one-size-fits-all solution. So be creative and work with your grantees to think outside the box of traditional response and, and outside the box of traditional grantees for, for many of us. We cannot improve resilience without addressing the root causes. Social vulnerability to disasters is as important as physical vulnerability to a hazard. So geography, health, race, class, age, disability status are all key factors. And funders should assess social vulnerabilities in the communities they serve and build equity assessments into their policies, practices, and operating procedures. Invest in your local communities for long-term recovery. 
large NGOs do amazing work during response, but they're not always on the ground for the length of time needed for complete recovery. Um, I think it was Lori or Antoine who mentioned, uh, you know, Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans. I'm, I live in New Orleans and 15 years later, still lots of recovery to be done, especially in communities of color. So find your local orgs who are going to be here after the media is left and build their capacity to respond. And data is important, but we don't always measure enough or what we need to be measuring. So move beyond numbers to look at what is really happening. Philanthropy could fund research into disaster vulnerability, but also invest more substantively in helping grantees evaluate their own work and deciding how to move forward. As our panelists have shared, there will be ongoing needs to assist for many years to come, and CDP has many resources um, you can see some listed, uh, our issue insights, our disaster profiles, webinars, and our staff are always available to provide uh, support and guidance. And you can find more information at www.disasterphilanthropy.org. And if you are a foundation or a funder planning disaster response funding, we also have additional resources and information in our disaster philanthropy playbook which is at www.disasterplaybook.org. So that is all the time we have. Thank you to Lori P, Antoine, and Lori V for taking time to share your thoughts and insights. Special thanks again to our webinar funder, the Rita Allen Foundation, and our co-sponsors, Council on Foundation, ABFI, Change Philanthropy, the Funders Network, and Charity Navigator. If there was anything that wasn't addressed today, you can uh, put them in the follow-up survey or email me at tanya.gulliver-garcia at disasterphilanthropy.org. Thank you and have a great afternoon, everyone.